Good morning. Um, I'm Carl Pierce. I have the privilege of serving as the director of the Howard H. Baker Jr. Center for Public Policy at the University of Tennessee. Um, it's my pleasure this morning to welcome all of you, um, both our distinguished speakers and our truly distinguished audience as, as well, to um, this first session in what we see as a year-long conversation, a U.S.-European summit on science, technology, innovation, and sustainable economic growth. Um, this has been convened by the Baker Center and the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and generously supported by the National Science Foundation, the United States Department of Energy, and the European Commission. Um, one necessary administrative detail, if you would please turn off your cell phones um, as not to distract our speakers and our thoughts as we deal with some important issues. Um, we convene for the purpose of trying to enhance our understanding of the ways in which science and innovation affect sustainable economic growth. Identify impediments to the flow of science from the laboratory to the market and to explore policy options that, that might enhance the impact of science on economic activity and our collective social well-being. Um, it's an important and challenging undertaking, and it's fitting that we start with some opening remarks from two distinguished Americans, Congressman Lee Hamilton and Senator Howard H. Baker, Jr., neither of whom is at the podium, as you might have noted, that Kent Hughes is not as tall as Lee Hamilton. And Though he am, wishes he were. <laughs> and, and I am taller than Senator Baker. Um, both wish they could be here, but have provided us with remarks to share with you. And also a distinguished European, which is very special for our international conference, um, Dr. Jean-Michel Baer, who is the director of the Science and Society Directorate in the Directorate General for Research and um, of the European Commission. So moving along, and it'll be important for us to t try to stay on schedule today, um, I'd like to just very briefly um, introduce um, Congressman Lee Hamilton and Dr. Kent Hughes, who will deliver his remarks. Not too much needs to be said about Congressman Hamilton that is not already known. He's president and director of the Woodrow Wilson um, International Center for Scholars. He's also the director of the Center on Congress at Indiana University. Um, 34 years in the Congress representing his district and chairing um, and being the ranking member of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs um, and also the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Um, since he left the Congress, he has been on commission after commission after commission. His guidance has been sought with respect to many intelligence security issues. The reason he cannot be with us this morning is he has been called to the Hill on um, important business, indicating the high regard he is, um, in which he's still held in, in, in Washington, D.C., in America. My pleasure to um, introduce uh, Dr. Kent Hughes, who's the director of the Wilson Center's Program on America and Glo Global Economy, um, to uh, share Congressman Hamilton's remarks. Thank you, Carl. Well, welcome again to the, uh, the Wilson Center and to the, the U.S.-European Summit on Science, Technology, Innovation, and Sustainable Economic Growth. Uh, Mr. Hamilton very much wish, wished he could have been here. As Carl said, he really got a call. In this case, it was from the Senate leadership, and they wanted him to come up and talk about Iran, which is a subject that is on many minds here in the United States. I wanted to uh, also uh, recognize the contribution of the Department of Energy, the National Science Foundation, and the, the European Commission for helping support this. And I, I really wanted to thank, of course, the Baker Center, who's contributed so much to the organization, really the inspiration for this conference. And I did want to single out one person here in the audience for a special recognition, Chairman Bart Gordon, Chairman of the House Science Committee who, as you know, took that first Rising Above the Gathering Storm report, turned it into the America Competes Act, and in a thoroughly bipartisan uh, uh, effort got it through the, the Congress, uh, which is, as we know, no mean feat. And uh, he assures me that before 
snow falls, as Senator Dirksen once said, on the broad breast of the Potomac, we'll have America Competes too as legislation on the President's desk. Well, for those of you that are new to the Wilson Center, I just uh, wanted to say a word about that. Lee Hamilton wanted to make sure that you knew the background of the center. We were established in 1968 by the Congress as a living memorial to Woodrow Wilson. They had decided against another monument or one more marble statue and wanted to create this living memorial. And the assignment they gave us to was to bring together both sides of Wilson's life. Uh, Wilson uh, is the only American president to have been, had a Ph.D. Uh, in his time, he was a very prominent political scientist, went on to be president of Princeton, governor of New Jersey, and then a two-term president. And he, Wilson, often commented that the scholar and the public policymaker were engaged in complementary enterprises, and that's what we try to do is bring together the people who are doing the best thinking about public policy together with people like yourselves who are implementing, influencing, and, and making public policy. This uh, is actually our fourth collaboration with the Baker Center, and it's in part a, a tribute to the very high regard that <coughs> Lee Hamilton has for, for Senator Howard Baker, who really has been a, a wonderful public man all through his life. Uh, this is... Uh, really a very a serious question, the question of sustainable economic growth and the role that science, technology, and innovation will play in it. I think, uh, really, as, as Lee Hamilton was saying to me, this is a question that all of us are going to be wrestling with for our professional lives and on through very much of the 21st century. Uh, as you may know, this is really the start of a year-long effort. There will be four working group meetings that take place, two here in the United States, one at the Baker Center, one here at the Wilson Center, and then two in Europe with a concluding summit at the end of that year-long effort to be held in Europe. Well, let me uh, just say again uh, how delighted we are to have so many of the very best thinkers here. Uh, it reminds me of one of Lee Hamilton's favorite quotes from Woodrow Wilson. Uh, Wilson often said that he needed all the brains he had and all the brains he could borrow. And that's very much what we're doing here today. Thank you again for coming. Thank you, Kent. Uh, it's now my pleasure to int introduce Jean-Michel Baer um, for his opening remarks. Um, he is the director of the Science and Society Directorate in the Directorate general for research of the European Commission. Um, he's had a long background that goes far beyond um, uh, science and society, but generally into society and media, communications, justice, and comes to his current position with a unique opportunity to think about the impact of, of science, not only on the economy, but the society in general. Special pleasure for both the Baker Center and the Wilson Center um, to in, uh, welcome Dr. Baer. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your nice words. Uh, distinguished guests, uh, dear American friends, uh, it's my pleasure also to, to welcome you uh, on behalf of the European Commission to this uh, summit so well organized by uh, um, Howard Baker Center and the Woodrow Wilson International Center uh, with the support of NSF and uh, we're happy to, to have contributed to, to that initiative. Uh, it is not only an honor to, to share such a meeting with you, um, we are particularly happy uh, that on both sides of the Atlantic there is a shared understanding that we can and we must address together common issues. US and EU are facing the consequences of the deepest systemic crisis since 1929. Together, we have lost a total of 15 million jobs. Our competitiveness and the growth of our economies have been impacted and will remain affected in the coming years. In Europe alone, we consider that the GDP lost due to the crisis uh, will, would be around 9% of the European uh, GDP, 
until 2020. We are both US and Europe facing external structural changes. The emergence of new and powerful competitors in a new multipolar world. A world where our combined populations will soon represent less than 10% of the world population. That means that 90% of the people living on Earth will be neither European nor American, 90%. EU and US are facing common pressing challenges, such as climate change, energy transition toward the post-carbon era, uh, healthy aging, social urban cohesion, for example. And we know that the response to these challenges will shape the future of our economy or our society and our society. Actually, it is not only up to us to find the right way out of the crisis. We also have to find a new path of growth and social development, and we can call it sustainable development. This is the direction which the EU wants to follow. This is the main goal of the European 2020 strategy, which the European Council, that is the, the, the gathering of head of state and governments, 27 now, adopted last, last June at the proposal of José Manuel Barroso, the President of the Commission. This strategy is based on three pillars. Smart growth, where research and innovation are playing a leading role. Sustainable growth, which addresses the sustainability issue for a number of key sectors of the economy and environment, like energy and climate, resource efficiency, transport, and finally, the pillar inclusive growth, which ensures that the social dimension is well embedded in the economic growth. This new strategy is particularly important in the context of the multipolar world I just mentioned. Globalization has led to the emergence and multiplication of world-class knowledge centers in emerging economies. Not only production networks are global, but also innovation networks have today a world dimension. A recent foresight exercise on the world in 2025, we have this for you, uh, that we carried out showed that the US and Europe might lose their scientific and technology leadership in the next 20 years to the benefit of Asia. This is why Europe needs to consolidate its its leaderships in areas such as renewable energies, advanced manufacturing technologies, or sustainable mobility, and to try to catch up with its partner in key enabling technology. In this respect, the EU also needs to tackle its weaknesses. If we are quite performant in science, the EU is the largest science bloc with more than 35% in scientific publication, the level of our investment is still insufficient and we are not so, so successful, so, so successful sorry, in capitalizing research and innovation for growth. <laughs> this is why next week, next week, on the 6th of uh, October, the Commission will adopt an important communication called Innovation Union, which has been prepared by our uh, Director General. Uh, it aims it's to indicate precisely what Europe needs to do in the coming years in terms of research and innovation, and link research and innovation. And the objective is clear, increase our research effort and better exploit it by redesigning our research and innovation system. We have recently calculated that if an ambitious R&D effort is made to reach 3% of GDP by 2020, Almost half of the GDP gap I was referring uh, earlier, caused by the crisis, would be filled. And this would lead to a net gain of almost 3 million jobs by the same date. So the impact of research and innovation is tremendous. Making the research innovation system the driver of the long-term recovery is our main goal. Here, Europe has to change gear and make decisive steps toward a real integration of its economy. We are facing obstacles you don't know. 
this, re this require for us creating a single innovation market through a new regulatory framework. EU patents it has taken uh, almost 15 years, you know, in Europe to, to, to create a, a single EU patent. Standard settings, interoperability of system, special regulation for public procurement uh, aiming at uh, innovative products and services, stimulating knowledge spillovers, in fact, both in intersectoral spillovers and international spillovers have strong impact on the value added by generated by research and innovation policy. That's why international cooperation is the, in this field is very important, and that's why we are here also to uh, to talk with our colleagues from uh, NSF on how to increase our this cooperation, enabling access to finance. High intensity sectors in the EU are 20 less R&D intensive than in your country, and this should be corrected. And uh, uh, we have a bad system in terms of uh, capital risk. It's not efficient. It, it does not profit of the whole market. That's why we want to, to um, remove the obstacle to the free, free uh, uh, circulation of freedom. So, sorry, so free circulation of uh, workers, researchers, and ideas, and knowledge that we call the fifth liberty. And developing European innovation partnership on some, on some topics, and the first uh, and there will be uh, announced by the Commission next week a first pilot project, and it will deal with uh, healthy aging, and it will be open to uh, international cooperation, of course. As is, al as is also mentioned is a new innovation strategy of President Obama, both research and innovation will have to address the grand challenges we are facing. And one more time, these challenges are of course needed to be addressed, but not only not only in the short in the short term, they, have, uh, they, they should be addressed in the long term with a, a, a true long term strategy because they are facing the future of our society, and the response we can uh, give to them uh, will be determinant for the shape of our society. So these issues are both top priority for policymakers and huge global market opportunity. The global market, for example, for eco-industries is expected to grow in the future. <coughs> the increasing importance of resource and energy efficiency, the tighter, the tighter in environmental regulation are driving force of such a development. We need to identify and to encourage the new driver of growth. In 2008, the International Labour Organization pointed at a doubling of the world eco-innovation market in 2020, with the creation of several million of green jobs. In this context, the EU is moving quite fast. For example, EU export from eco-industry increased by 44% between 1999 and 2007, much more than its partners. Let me conclude. Rising Asia is a fact, but together, US and Europe, sharing strong common values, we represent more than 60% of the world science. The transatlantic relations remain crucial for each side of the ocean. In the last 10 years, more than 700 US teams participated in European research projects thanks to our framework program. I'm speaking about cooperation with the EU, not bilateral cooperation, which has also uh, a, a real Im importance. The total cost of these projects amounted to a total value of about 1.5 billion euros. This last year, the EU-US cooperation has been very strong in fields like health, but also information and communication technologies, nanosciences, and biotechnology. We are convinced that US and Europe have a lot to win by working together on research and innovation, sharing methods, data, samples, and scientists could provide benefits from both parts of the Atlantic. This summit, the EU 
and U.S. Summit on Science, Technology, Innovation, and Sustainable Development Growth introduce society, environment, and sustainability in the cycle from research to economic growth. It also emphasizes innovation. I'm convinced that we will learn a lot from your experience in this domain. Thank you very much. <coughs> My pleasure to add some greetings from Senator Baker. Um, Senator Baker is the honoree um, in whose honor the Baker Center was established by the University of Tennessee. Distinguished Senator for three terms from the great state of Tennessee, and I'd also like to acknowledge that Congressman Bart Gordon is also from the great state of Tennessee um, as, as well. Um, after th the three terms in the Senate, he served President Reagan as his chief of staff and then served as the United States ambassador to Japan, um, appointed by President um, uh, George W. Bush. Um, with respect to his interest in foreign collaborations, he has extensive foreign policy experience. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the Washington Institute for Foreign Affairs, and he's on the board of the Forum for International Policy and is an international counselor for the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He would object that I spend any time on his biography and would want me to just note that he's very proud of the Howard H. Baker Jr. Center for Public Policy, what he is. He sees its honor in its programming. He sees us charged with um, promoting dialogue, about our unique system of governance. He views it as young and fragile, and he's particularly concerned about the rampant incivility which we're seeing in political processes as well as in governmental work. Um, he wants us to address important policy issues. In addition to our focus on the governance, we have a vibrant energy and environmental policy program and a vibrant global security policy program. Um, the topic for this program transcends all three of those and, in effect, lays the foundation for the future of governance, global security, and ultimately um, a sustainable environment. So he is very pleased um, that we are here today, and he very much regrets that he is unable to be here with us. Um, I'm going to read his remarks. Um, I know Senator Baker well enough to know that he feels completely free to ignore anything any speechwriter writes for him. Um, I feel less at liberty. Um, Senator Baker starts, and I can't sound like him or look like him, but I appreciate the sponsorship of this summit by the National Science Foundation, the United States Department of Energy, and the European Commission. And the vision and leadership of Dr. Bob Shelton, who is a senior fellow and director of the Energy and Environment uh, Policy Program at the Baker Center. Um, Dr. Jim Roberto, who is the Associate Laboratory Director at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And Dr. Kent Hughes, the Director of the Program on America and the Global Economy here at the Wilson Center. Without their vision, inspiration, and just plain old hard work, this would not have happened. I'm very pleased that the summit continues a fruitful collaboration between the Baker Center and the Wilson Center, in which we brought together experts to address such important issues as the role of nuclear energy in global and domestic energy policy, the American competitiveness, and the formulation of a bipartisan energy and climate policy for America. Please remember that Senator Baker is a proud Republican. He is not a bipartisan. The Baker Center is not a bipartisan public policy institute. It is an independent, nonpartisan policy center, and what Senator Baker was known for as a Republican was his open-mindedness, his ability to follow his daddy's advice that sometimes the person with whom you agree may have something you should listen to and occasionally may be right. Um, and so he was thrilled when we collaborated on an attempt to come up with bipartisan energy and climate policy. I'm also pleased that this, Senate, this summit has provided me one more opportunity to collaborate with my good friend, Congressman Lee Hamilton, 
who has served his home state of Indiana and America for so long and so well, and more recently, to be quite honest, has also served the world as the director and, and president and um, chief um, executive officer of the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, I wish him well in his future endeavors and hope that we will once again have the opportunity to work together in the effort to formulate sound public policy about such important issues as you will be discussing today. Also want to extend a special welcome to Dr. Jean-Michel Baer and the representatives from the European Commission who are participating in the summit. Looking at the world as we now know it, it seems clear to me that the public policy issues that we will face are international in scope and importance. I'm pleased that the Baker Center is promoting international dialogue about science, technology, innovation, and the sustainability of the world's economic growth and that experts from the European Commission have joined us today and will enrich our conversations. While I can't be with you today, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. As some of you know, I have been a strong advocate for science throughout my public life. I still am. This is a crucial time for both America and the world as we confront the new reality of a fully interdependent global economy in which there will be intense competition but also a great need for cooperation, particularly with respect to the scientific enterprise upon which our future economy must be built. The fact that this is an international meeting in which we are joined by our colleagues from Europe is extremely important because we must learn from each other and we must learn how to work with each other even when we may not agree with each other. I'm pleased that today is just the beginning of a year-long dialogue that will give us new insights into the ways to speed the process through which we try to capture the benefits of scientific research for both our economic and social well-being. Uh, thank you for participating in this important endeavor. And with those remarks, we'll continue with our program. Thank you. And it is my pleasure now to invite to the podium uh, Dr. Uh, Venki Narayana Murthy, who is the Director of the Science, Technology, and Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School to introduce um, our first keynote speaker. Thank you very much, Carl. It really is a great honor for me to introduce my longtime friend and colleague, Dr. John Holdren. John is a pioneer in the field which we're going to discuss a lot. He way in, saw way ahead of most of us the need for interdisciplinary pro graduate programs at the intersection of energy and resources when he was at the University of California, Berkeley. His, uh, his early degrees were in aerospace engineering and theoretical plasma physics from MIT and Stanford. He is known for his work at this intersection and has received many awards and has served as the president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He was an early recipient of the MacArthur Prize Fellowship and the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement. He became the John uh, Hines Professor of Environment Policy and Director of the Science, Technology and Public Policy Program at Harvard University in 1996 and where he was until he left to become Assistant to the President for Science and Technology, Director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, and Co-Chair of the President's Council on Science and Technology, PCAST. My colleague, John Holdren. tackle you before you get oh, to the podium, but uh, he's on his way. He should be here momentarily. Uh, we received a message that he, perfect. <laughs> John, I only said good things about you. <laughs> Talk about just in time delivery. <laughs> One of his last acts when he was at Harvard was to organize a conference on just-in-time energy policy. <laughs> Seems to be my hallmark. Uh, well, I apologize. Uh, I had a, hey there, Marcy. 
I had a, uh, a meeting in the White House just before this, and, uh, and then the White House car took me to the wrong building. Uh, so uh, I see a lot of uh, familiar and friendly faces in here. It's great to be here. I'm going to uh, extemporize for a moment while they load my PowerPoint. Uh, but uh, this is uh, obviously... Extemporized. Going to extemporize, I'm going to extemporize extemporaneously over, here over while, there. Well, well, well I'll, I'll, I can also help you find, <laughs> find the file. But um, I guess this is uh, classic White House scheduling. <laughs> hey, Cora. <laughs> Hi, Bart. Uh, this is indeed a, a room full of friends. I begin to worry that there's nobody here who doesn't already know everything I'm going to say. Uh, so I hope that at least I will manage to say it uh, in, in an interesting way. Down here in the dates till we get to wait stop uh, 2010. Oh, those don't seem to be in descending order. That is bizarre. Maybe they did it a different way. Let's see if we can look at the whole at the whole list. U.S. Europe, okay, it's going to be this one. This one here? Yeah, that's going to be it. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. I wanted to do this. This one right here? Yeah. Okay. That is the one. The other thing I'm going to do while waiting is take this off. All right. There you go. So let me start uh, by apologizing preemptively for the wordy cower PowerPoint. I don't speak uh, from notes. I speak from my PowerPoint, and I like to make it self-contained enough to distribute to people afterwards, including those uh, who weren't there. So um, let me uh, say that it's uh, a great pleasure to be here with this, uh, with this very distinguished group. And it's been a great pleasure to be working uh, for this particular president and for a great many distinguished colleagues in the administration and in the Congress, some of whom are in this room, because it has been uh, a, a delight to work with a set of leaders who really do understand how and why science, technology, and innovation matter uh, for our future, for the future of our partners, uh, and for the future of the world. The president has been extremely clear about that, as I will be uh, emphasizing. Let's see if I can figure out which, uh, which keys this thing likes. Doesn't like that one. Okay, let's try that. Uh, I'll start with the challenges that we face that are so clearly linked to science, technology, and innovation. Obviously, uh, top of the list is economic recovery and growth, and the role of science and technology as drivers uh, of recovery and growth. And there are all kinds of categories, including some probably yet to be invented, that are going to be germane. Uh, Health care also near the top of the list, where the aim is better outcomes for all, all of our citizens at lower cost. Uh, energy and climate, uh, cleaner, safer energy supply. We'd like to be able to reduce our oil imports. We'd like to be able to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. whole host of other resource and environmental issues, water, land use, uh, coastal zones, toxics, biodiversity. And, of course, national and homeland security, science and technology rich domain, where we need better tools for our troops <coughs> and homeland protectors, uh, better cyber and power grid security, better biodefense, uh, figuring out how, how to ensure the safety and reliability of a shrinking U.S. nuclear stockpile without nuclear testing, all science and technology laden issues. Uh, those were the domestic ones. Of course, there are a great number of global ones in which we have a strong stake, combating preventable and pandemic disease, uh, transforming the global energy system and land use practices to avoid unmanageable degrees of climate change. Uh, deploying science and technology around the world for poverty eradica eradication, for development, for adapting to that part of climate change which we're not able to avoid. I like to say, uh, as was the subtitle of a UN report in which I was involved a few years ago, our climate challenge is to 
avoid the unmanageable and to manage the unavoidable, that two-pronged challenge that has mitigation and adaptation in equal measure. Uh, managing the competition, which is intensifying the competition for land and water among food, fiber, fuel, and ecosystem function, and maintaining the ecological integrity and productivity of the oceans, obviously a global challenge of enormous importance, and finally, globally, reducing the risks from weapons of mass destruction. A few words about how President Obama views these challenges. First, he views them as interconnected, uh, and that means they have to be addressed together. They can't be thought of or managed uh, separately. Uh, second point is that science, technology, and innovation are not just germane to addressing these challenges, they're central uh, to addressing the challenges. Third point is that success requires not only applying science, technology, and innovation to the specific challenges I've enumerated, but it also requires nurturing uh, what I like to call the cross-cutting foundations of capability in science, technology, and innovation. I'll say more about that in a minute. The centrality of science, technology, and innovation in addressing these challenges means putting them in the center of what the federal government thinks, says, and does about them. The president in his inaugural speech talked about this in terms of putting science in its rightful place in the government. And the interconnectedness of these problems means, among other things, that the solutions require partnerships and partnerships along a number of axes, partnerships among federal agencies, uh, among the branches and levels of government, that is, the legislative branch, the executive branch, federal, state, re regional, local, requires partnerships among the public, private, and philanthropic sectors, and it requires, of course, as the theme of this meeting emphasizes, partnership uh, among, partnerships among nations. Uh, and this really is what the President meant when he has said repeatedly that to address these challenges we need all hands on deck. We not only need all hands on deck, but we need them all holding hands, if you will. Talk a little bit about the interconnectedness of the challenges. Um, I would suggest, and I have suggested in a number of forums, that human well-being depends equally on economic, environmental, and socio-political conditions. It's impossible to say which one is more important because they're all indispensable. And that means that true development and growth entail enhancing all three or at least not advancing one in ways that seriously degrade the others. Second point about interconnectedness is that poverty, ignorance, environmental degradation, and disease are all linked in vicious circles of cause and effect. And those blights are most effectively attacked together. That's true in both industrial and developing country contexts, and it's true that often a key to addressing all of them at once is improving the status and opportunity of women and girls, and that has been another theme uh, in this administration. Another aspect of interconnectedness, of course, is that reducing health care costs while extending coverage and improving outcomes is an enormous challenge, but clearly essential for limiting government deficits as well as for other social and economic reasons. And finally, although this is not the last of the interconnections that could be mentioned, the clean energy revolution that we're going to need to improve air and water quality and limit climate change risk is also going to bring us high quality jobs, it's going to spin off new products and businesses, it's going to preserve uh, economic competitiveness. Let me talk a minute about the centrality of science, technology, and innovation. What do we need from science, technology, and innovation that can really make a difference? Well, for the economy, we need innova innovation that yields better manufacturing techniques, better products and services, and thus, through those, high quality, sustainable jobs. In health, we need new information technology tools for medical records, for doctor-doctor and doctor-patient interaction, for better and cheaper diagnostics, for faster vaccine development and production, for cancer therapies that target only cancer cells, uh, and a good deal more. In energy, we need clearly better batteries, cheaper photovoltaic cells, lower impact biofuels, CO2 capture and sequestration, safer nuclear fuel cycles. Fusion would be nice. I started my career working on fusion in 1966. Uh, we haven't got it yet. Obviously, I was a failure at that job, and so I tried some others. Climate change. We need better monitoring, both in situ and from space. We need better models on faster computers. We need regional disaggregation of impacts in order to support adaptation efforts. We need better scientific communication for public understanding. National and homeland security. Some of the things we need is better ability to detect both conventional and nuclear explosives and to detect clandestine weapons facilities. We need faster identification of and response to bio threats. We need better defenses against cyber threats. And again, I put the dot, 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 because everybody in this room could add some items to any one of these lists. 
Let me turn to the cross-cutting foundations of success in science, technology, and innovation. I start with the institutions that do most of our basic research, our research universities, our national laboratories, nonprofits. Uh, they need to be nurtured. They need to be nourished. Uh, other key infrastructure, and I call those institutions part of our infrastructure, really, but other key infrastructure, of course, include information technology and broadband, high-speed computing, energy, and transportation infrastructure, and even space. People sometimes think of space as being mainly about exploration, mainly about understanding the universe. It is about that, but it's also about communications, geopositioning, Earth observations, a whole set of capabilities that we need uh, as part of our infrastructure to be able to address these challenges. Uh, next on the list, and certainly not lowest important, in importance, indeed the President would say it's first in importance, is science, technology, engineering, and math, that is STEM education, from preschool to grad school and lifelong. We need that not just to educate the next generation of Nobel Prize winners, winners of National Medals of Technology and Innovation and National Medals of Science, uh, our leading inventors and innovators, but we need it to produce the technology-savvy workforce that's going to be required to be competitive in the 21st century, and we need it to produce the science-savvy citizenry. We need, in order to have a functioning democracy uh, in a society where more and more of the issues before the democracy have science uh, and technology content. Uh, <clears throat> and the fourth big cross-cutting foundation of success is we need economic and policy conditions that are conducive to entrepreneurship, to innovation, and to partnerships. That means strong intellectual property rights, lots of financing options, appropriate tax policies, export policies, immigration policies, and transparency and predictability in regulation. All of those things are important to the innovation environment. Now, how come I have that slide twice? Oh, well. Uh, the federal support structure for science, technology, uh, and innovation. I start with the science and technology rich cabinet departments and the agencies that sit within them. Defense, which contains the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, Health and Human Services, of course, with NIH, the Food and Drug Administration, Center for Disease Control, uh, Department of Energy with its ARPA-E, Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy, the Commerce Department with NOAA, with the National Institute of Standards and Technology, Department of Interior, which has the USGS, the Department of Agriculture, which has the new National Institute of Food and Agriculture, the State Department with its Bureau of Oceans, Environment, and Science. And then we have the freestanding science, technology, and innovation linked agencies, and those, of course, include the National Science Foundation, and I see the, the former director, Arden B. Mint, sitting down there, and I see the current acting director, Cora Merritt, there. Uh, NASA, I know the head of that is not here because I just talked to him this morning. Charlie Bolden is in Prague working on U.S.-European space cooperation. Uh, the EPA, of course. Federal Communications Commission, the Small Business Administration, as we will see, has major roles in promoting uh, innovation in the private sector. Uh, the Executive Office of the President, uh, efforts on science, technology, and innovation there led by the Office of Science and Technology Policy, the National Science and Technology Council, over which it presides, and the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, which is administratively supported and substantively supported in OSTP. But in addition, and I'll say more about those uh, offices in a moment. In addition, the National Economic Council, headed by Larry Summers, has a major role in innovation policy. The Domestic Policy Council, headed by Melody Barnes, has a major role in a number of these aspects, but particularly in science, technology, engineering, and math education. The National Security Staff and the Homeland Security Staff, of course, have major roles in this domain. And the Office of Management and Budget, we all know what its role is. Uh, although it actually has a number of roles, you cannot forget the management in its name along with the budget, but we all uh, in this business deal extensively with OMB in relation to the science and technology budgets of all of these other entities. And uh, last but again not least, I say that particularly looking at Bart Gordon in the third row, the science and technology authorizing and appropriations committees in both houses of Congress are extremely important. Uh, say a word about the responsibilities of my office uh, and, uh, and me individually as the President's Science and Technology Advisor. Uh, they come in two clumps. Uh, one, policy for science and technology, which means 
uh, as indicated here, analysis recommendations, coordination with other White House offices on R&D budgets and related policies, on science and technology education and workforce issues, interagency initiatives in this domain, broadband, open government, scientific integrity, all those are aspects of policy for science and technology. The other side of this coin and this formulation is due to my late mentor in this domain, uh, Harvey Brooks, uh, who pointed out many years ago, decades ago, this two-sided uh, character of science and technology policy. The other half is science and technology for policy, which means in the case of this office and my role, independent advice for the president. That means independent of the agendas of particular uh, cabinet departments and agencies, one hopes objective uh, advice for the president about science and technology germane to all of the policy issues with which he's concerned. That obviously is a broad mandate because, as I've already suggested, the issues with which he's concerned, which include the economy, health care, energy, climate change, national and homeland security, all have large science and technology uh, components. Uh, I have an interesting dual role. Uh, I am both assistant to the president, meaning I'm part of the senior White House staff, not subject to Senate confirmation, not uh, subject to being compelled to testify before congressional committees, but I'm also the Senate confirmed director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, and because that's a statutory office, uh, I do have to be confirmed by the Senate. I was uh, on March 19th of 2009, and uh, I do have to testify uh, when uh, invited. And that's sort of an interesting combination, because sometimes when I get invited, people say, what did you say to the president about X? And that part is privileged under the first title, uh, assistant to the president, where I don't have to answer what I said to the president, but I do have to answer what we're doing in OSTP. Uh, that office, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, has uh, four additional Senate-confirmed uh, positions, Associate Directors for Science, for Technology, who's also the nation's chief technology officer, Anish Chopra, Associate Director for Environment, Associate Director for National Security and International Affairs. We have a staff of about 90, uh, 65 or so, so uh, of whom are technical professionals, that is, uh, with advanced degrees in science, engineering, uh, mathematics, uh, a couple social scientists as well. Uh, more than half of those are detailed from other agencies. We get great benefit from our detailees, from DOD, DOE, Agriculture, NSF, NOAA, uh, folks who understand the science and technology business as it goes on in those agencies and bring that understanding to the White House. And then when they go back to their agencies, take insights about how the White House works uh, to the benefit of those agencies back. Our budget is about $7 million a year. Uh, I would say not a lot from the standpoint of what we do, but we're always grateful to uh, Congressman Gordon and his colleagues uh, for maintaining that uh, where it is. And I hope we can keep doing that. Uh, the National Science and Technology Council, which I mentioned before, is nominally chaired by the president and populated by cabinet secretaries. In practice, it's chaired by me and populated by deputy secretaries and undersecretaries of the cabinet departments with science and technology missions, plus the heads of the NSF, NIH, NASA, NOAA, NIST, EPA, USGS, CDC. Uh, probably left out a couple. Um, and it's primarily concerned with interagency science and technology coordination cooperation uh, initiatives. Uh, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology started out with three chairs, myself, uh, Eric Lander, the head of the joint MIT Harvard Broad Institute, and Harold Varmus. Uh, Harold has since uh, left PCAST to become the director of the National Cancer Institute, so we now have two co-chairs. 18 other members from academia, industry, and NGOs. They all keep their day jobs and advise the White House on a part-time basis. I'll say a few words in a minute about how energetically uh, they do so. Uh, let me give you some indicators of the priority that this administration is placing on science, technology, and innovation. And the first one is presidential appointments. We have five Nobel laureates in science. Uh, in presidential appointments in this administration. I'm sure that's never happened before. Energy Secretary Chu, OSTP Associate Director for Science Carl Wyman, just confirmed a week and a half ago, mentioned the Director of the National Cancer Institute, Harold Varmus, and PCAST members Mario Molina and Ahmed Zuel, uh, all Nobel Prize winners in science. In presidential appointments, we have more than another 25 members of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, Institute of Medicine, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, including the heads of NIH, NOAA, USGS, FDA, NAFA. Uh, we have a CTO, 
Anish Chopra and a CIO chief information officer Vivek Kundra in the White House for the first time. We have an engineer running EPA, a chemical engineer, uh, Lisa Jackson. Uh, I would suggest that science, technology, and innovation have never in the history of the federal government been so prominent uh, in leadership uh, positions. This is the president with the first seven members of the National Academy of Sciences appointed in his administration uh, in the National Academy of Sciences boardroom on April 27th of last year when he addressed uh, the National Academy on the country's science and technology opportunities and priorities. Uh, that takes me to speeches and events. He has highlighted science, technology, and innovation over and over again, starting with his campaign, the inaugural address, major speeches around the country and around the world, uh, and also at an extraordinary array of White House events featuring science, technology, and innovation, uh, celebrating uh, school science and math uh, winners in the national competitions, the winners of the National Medals of Science and of Technology and Innovation. He's had, he's had U.S. astronauts uh, shuttle crews and International Space Station crews in, uh, on seven different occasions. Uh, the U.S. Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize winners in science, uh, the winners of the uh, government's math and science teaching awards, the winners of the Presidential Early Career Awards in science and engineering. He almost never is, has been too busy uh, to meet with these folks and to use the occasion to talk about science, technology, and innovation. This is the president with middle school mathletes in the Oval Office. I could show you dozens of pictures of scientists, engineers, and students in the Oval Office. And after virtually every meeting, the president says to me on the way out, you know, I wish I could talk more to science and math students and scientists and engineers and less to sports teams. Um, <laughs> another indication of priority is how busy the president has kept his PCAST, his Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. He has requested studies from PCAST on all of these topics. Science of H1N1, the National Nanotech Initiative, Building Capability for Future Influenza Response, Health IT, uh, Improving K-12 through STEM Education. Uh, all of those have been released. The remaining ones are in process and relatively close to release, Accelerating Energy Technology Innovation, Advanced Manufacturing, Networking and Information Technology R&D Review, and Biodiversity and Ecosystem Management for Sustainability. You see in the diversity of those topics the sense uh, both of the importance of all of these dimensions of sustainable well-being and the President's uh, understanding of how important and interconnected they all are. PCAST has never, I am sure, in history been asked to do so much so soon uh, in an administration. That's the President meeting uh, with his PCAST in the uh, Jefferson State uh, Dining Room in, uh, in March of this year. Initiatives in science, technology, and innovation. Of course, everybody knows if you want to understand what's happening, one of the things you have to do is watch the money. Uh, science got a huge boost in the stimulus and recovery package, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, more formally, and in the 2009 omnibus and the 2010 budgets, which gave 2009 and 2010 the highest federal research spending ever. The Total Recovery Act funds for science and technology, including not just R&D, but IT and transportation infrastructure, applied energy technology, space exploration, exceeded $100 billion. Uh, and last year, uh, the President announced at his speech at the National Academy of Sciences in April a number of very specific goals. The goal of doubling the budgets of the National Science Foundation, the DOE Office of Science, and the NIST laboratories over the space of a decade. The goal of making the research and experimentation tax credit permanent. Uh, and the goal of lifting public and private investment in research and development to equal or greater than 3% of GDP, where it has never been uh, in this country. The highest it's ever been is 2.9% at the height of the space race in the late 1960s. Uh, science, technology, and innovation initiatives in energy and climate. Eighty billion dollars for clean and efficient, uh, and efficient energy in the Recovery Act. The creation of ARPA-E, uh, which got 400 million in 2009 to 10, 300 million proposed for 2011. Uh, energy innovation hubs, a variety of other investments in that domain. The first ever combined fuel economy and greenhouse gas tailpipe standards. Uh, strengthened bilateral partnerships on energy and climate change with Brazil, China, India, Japan, Russia, and more, about which I will have more to say uh, in a moment. The U.S. Global Change Research Program uh, increased by nearly 20 percent in real terms in the President's FY 2011 proposal to nearly $2.6 billion. Uh, standing up an interagency task force being led by OSTP, the Council on Environmental Quality, and NOAA on coordination of the government's adaptation activities. 
and continuing pursuit of comprehensive energy climate legislation in Congress. We didn't get it this time. We'll be back. Investments are continuing. The budget proposals for 2011, to say a little more about them, if the President's budget were approved, the total of federal R&D would reach almost $150 billion. Non-defense R&D at $66 billion would be up nearly 5% in real terms. Uh, all research, basic and applied, but not development, uh, would grow at 4.5% real. Uh, NASA R&D at $11 billion would be up in real terms 17%. NIH up 2%. Basic research at $33 billion, up 3.3% in real terms. Uh, even in DOD, interestingly enough, basic research is up 8% in real terms, reaching for the first time $2 billion. Uh, and NSF, DOE science, and the NIST labs are on track to double in a decade between 2007 and 17. again, if those budgets are approved. The President rolled out uh, last September, uh, that is a year ago, a new American innovation strategy in basically three parts. First part, invest in the building blocks of innovation. That relates to those foundations of capability in science, technology, and innovation. Restore leadership in fundamental research. Boost STEM education. Strengthen physical infrastructure. Develop an advanced information technology ecosystem. Second element, promote competitive markets to spur innovation. Capital markets that fund innovation. Innovation-based entrepreneurship. Boost public sector and community innovation. And promote American exports. Third ingredient, catalyze breakthroughs for national priorities. A clean energy revolution, advanced vehicle technology, health IT, and the other grand challenges that we've already uh, talked about here. STEM education. The President has said on a number of occasions that he believes the single most important thing we can do for the future of this country and more broadly in the world for the future of our society is improve the quality and the reach of science, technology, engineering, and math education. In this administration, the efforts uh, coming on the executive branch side are joint efforts of the White House, uh, notably the Office of Science and Technology Policy and the Domestic Policy Council and the Department of Education. Secretary uh, Duncan is a fabulous advocate of strengthening STEM education. A lot of these are joint efforts uh, that engage as well the National Science Foundation, Health and Human Services, DOD, DOD, NASA, and even more. Again, we have some new national goals, moving American kids from the middle to the top of international rankings on the standardized science and math tests, and increasing the American proportion of college graduates to first in the world by 2020. The $4.4 billion race to the top in the Recovery Act includes preference to states whose proposals for a share of this money emphasize innovation in science, technology, engineering, and math education. The Educate to Innovate program, which the President rolled out late last November, is focused on improving K-12 through STEM education uh, through partnerships with the private sector and the philanthropic sector to train more teachers, to bring more uh, scientists and engineers and mathematicians from the real world into the classroom, to work with teachers not only to generate more interesting and instructive hands-on experience so kids can learn about science and engineering by doing it, not just by being lectured at about it, um, but uh, also uh, includes the value of those folks as role models to illustrate for kids what fascinating careers are available to them out there uh, should they pursue science, math, uh, engineering, innovation. Uh, we just added this month uh, the rollout of a program called Change the Equation, which has more than 100 CEOs uh, participating. It's uh, a nonprofit entity headed uh, by Craig Barrett, the former CEO of Intel, and Sally Ride, the first American woman in space, also a leading innovator in STEM education. And it's aimed at vastly upgrading the teacher core uh, in uh, science, technology, engineering, and math teaching uh, at the K through 12 level. There have been some initiatives in, in, in the domain I call principles and procedures. Some people think this is a boring domain, but it's one that is uh, important uh, ultimately to getting it right. The stem cell guidelines, uh, scientific integrity uh, principles, uh, reporting procedures for federal grants, which we streamlined and made consistent uh, across the agencies for the first time, uh, and open government, new and expanded access to databases uh, at every agency. This is uh, the Open Government uh, Initiative webpage, uh, which I recommend. It has uh, links to a huge variety of government databases that have never been accessible before. 
Uh, this is the data.gov uh, catalog homepage where you can search by categories, you can search by agencies, you can search by file type. Uh, really a fabulous innovation which people are widely using already. Uh, continuing with the theme of partnerships, a few words about working with the private sector. Firms in the United States, the private sector funds two-thirds of U.S. R&D and performs almost three-quarters of U.S. R&D. Private sector is much more important in these quantitative terms than the government itself, but what the government does is important to what the private sector does in this domain. That's why the President has proposed repeatedly to make the research and experimentation tax credit permanent. Uh, the Recovery Act has helped start and grow clean energy businesses across the country. The Small Business Innovation uh, Research Initiative, SBIR, uh, has been and continues to provide funding from diverse agencies for many different avenues of innovation. The Small Business Lending Bill, just signed uh, by the President uh, yesterday, increases loans and cuts taxes for entrepreneurs. And the DOE's energy innovation hubs, which I mentioned already, are linking national labs, universities, and industry in the clean and efficient energy uh, enterprise. That's the uh, SBIR, the Small Business Innovation Research website. Again, I recommend if you haven't visited these and you're interested in this question of how government can encourage uh, innovation, uh, you should certainly have a look. This is just a small fraction of the uh, funding opportunities listed there that would fit on this one, uh, on this one slide. Uh, prizes and challenges, something that this administration has gotten very excited about, is using far more than any previous administration has. Uh, these are ways to harness the ingenuity that's lurking out there in individual schools, firms, NGOs all across the country. We now have, uh, as of about uh, a week and a half ago, a new challenge.gov website, which is a one-stop shopping place for all the challenges and prizes that are out there, many of them, again, joint ventures of uh, industry and government. Good example uh, of such a joint venture which illustrates the leverage in the prize business is the recent Progressive Insurance DOE Automotive X Prize, which offered $10 million in prizes for super fuel efficient passenger vehicles and called forth more than $100 million in innovation by the groups uh, competing uh, for the prize. And this is from the, uh, the ceremony that was held uh, just a week and a half ago, uh, awarding that $10 million in prize money to an extraordinary set uh, of vehicles. Uh, turning finally to the international science, technology, and innovation uh, cooperation domain, a focus, uh, obviously, of this gathering. Uh, we've been doing a lot. We've been in reviving and strengthening the high-level joint committee meetings on science and technology cooperation that the United States uh, has at the ministerial levels with Russia, China, India, Brazil, Japan, and South Korea. All of those uh, have now met. Some have met twice in this country and in the partner country. The only one uh, left to go is Russia, but I've been to Russia twice pursuing uh, science and technology cooperation under the Bilateral Presidential Commission's Science and Technology Working Group uh, already. Uh, convening the Multilateral Economic Forum with a strong focus on energy and climate cooperation. Uh, making science, technology, and innovation a centerpiece of the Cairo speech on outreach to the Muslim world, which led to the appointment of a first cohort of science envoys, very distinguished scientists who went out and spent weeks uh, developing initiatives, identifying opportunities with counterparts in countries across the Muslim world. And we've just announced the second cohort of science envoys who will now go forth with an even broader uh, geographic scope to do the same. Uh, science, technology, and engineering have been made a centerpiece of USAID development strategy by its new administrator, uh, Raj Shah, who, by the way, is an MD and a member of the Institute of Medicine. Uh, pursuing international cooperation in space, something that Charlie Bolden has been energetically engaged in since he uh, became the administrator of NASA. That's what he's doing right now as we speak uh, in Prague. Soon he'll be going to China. Uh, to discuss uh, increasing U.S.-Chinese uh, cooperation in space. And we've been streamlining the visa procedures, a nitty-gritty sort of thing, but one that's very important. If you can't get your colleagues into the country, uh, you can't collaborate uh, very easily. And we've had a lot of problems with that, particularly in the wake of 9-11, but those problems have now been largely resolved with the cooperation of the Department of Homeland Security, the State Department, the CIA, and the FBI. Uh, finally, uh, just a very brief uh, focus on U.S.-Europe science, technology, and innovation cooperation, really the theme of, of, of this uh, gathering. 
Uh, Europe obviously remains a crucial strategic partner of the United States. The two regions have enormous uh, mutual interests in, uh, in the economic domain, in the environmental domain, in the security domain. Our common challenges uh, listed here include broadband and spectrum management, e-government and e-health technologies, clean energy, smart grids, and more. Uh, cooperation in science, technology, and innovation is a core element of the U.S.-Europe relationship and uh, is steadily being strengthened. The President Obama uh, told me in our first meeting that one of the things he wanted me to do as his science and technology advisor is build up our cooperation uh, in these domains with partners all around the world, including Europe. Uh, I have actually met personally with the science leadership of the UK, France, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Poland, I left off Ireland, didn't have a chance to adjust the slide on the way over, uh, and of course the joint science leadership of the EU to discuss strengthening existing uh, collaborative efforts and building uh, new ones. Uh, the US-European Union Joint Consultative Group on Science and Technology had a major meeting in Washington this May. We had more than 25 representatives from the EU and its member states, 50 participants from 15 U.S. science agencies. The focuses included uh, our bilateral cooperation activities in R&D on infotech, nanotech, energy, biomedicine, cyber infrastructure, homeland security, earth observing systems, and that list is not complete, and also a focus on how better to prioritize the global challenges that it is in our mutual interest to address, food security, global health, sustainable energy. Uh, and climate change. The prospects. A huge advantage that we have is that the leaders uh, of the United States and the leaders in the European Union countries all clearly recognize the challenges and the opportunities in this domain. We all now understand that this is important, that it's something we have to get right, that it's something we have to do jointly. Uh, much has been and is being achieved in science, technology, and innovation by our countries individually and together, and increasingly so in the last couple of years. At the same time, though, it is clear that there is a great deal more to do and that getting it done under the financial constraints we all face will take all the ingenuity and, I may say, all the cooperation that we can muster. So I thank you very much for your attention. damage did I do to the clock? Quite a lot. Uh, <coughs> but I started late through my own. Uh, through my, yeah, I'd be, I'd be willing to uh, entertain some questions. Please. I'm Bob Castro with uh, Lockheed Martin. And Sir, if you could wait for the microphone. <laughs> I'm Bob Castro, currently with Lockheed Martin, but formerly a State Department official and a former congressional staffer. And as I reminded Bart, uh, back when the Congressional Office of Technology Assessment existed, I was professional staff there as well. Um, I think you, you have, as we would say down in Tennessee, a, a choir, uh, a bunch of folks who are, who are sharing your optimism and uh, forward-looking uh, hopefulness for the future. But one of the things not addressed, and I hope it gets addressed throughout the panel by the day and, and perhaps by Cora when she speaks, um, is the public policy aspect of, of what people in the general public see in the scientific debates of the day. It starts with um, drug approvals and food safety and things that they don't necessarily understand. It moves to the politicization of scientific data on issues like climate change. Uh, and on the European trade front, it might be agriculture policy, sanitary, phytosanitary, intellectual property rights, things that we're trying to agree on in protocols, but um, makes it much more difficult for uh, the, the folks that BART and other members of Congress represent to have faith that we are making science-based decisions. And so I see that as a, a, an existential challenge that those of us who are pro-science and technology in the room have to face. I'm hoping you can give us some guidance on, on how to address those issues of scientific misconduct or politicization as they come up. Thanks. Thank you for that, uh, for that question. I, I guess I would say that there are two dimensions uh, to uh, our uh, ability to respond to that set of challenges, short term and long term. Uh, the long term, in a sense, is the easier to describe. This is one of the reasons we need to do better at science, technology, engineering, and math education. Uh, we teach, I think, as it stands, uh, maybe too many facts and too little about what science is and how it works. And it leaves uh, a vast proportion of our population uh, unable 
to render uh, any judgment on what is credible and what is not credible, what is authoritative and what is not. Uh, people don't understand, for example, most people don't understand that all science is uncertain, all science is contingent, uh, all science is subject to being uh, revised or even overturned by better data, better analysis. Good scientists are always ready to revise and overturn uh, their current position if a persuasive uh, new data set or new analysis comes along that reveals that the previous position wasn't quite right. Uh, people who want to demagogue, demagogue these issues often do it by pointing to the uncertainties and saying, wow, there are, there's uncertainty here, so I guess we'd better not do anything. Uh, obviously oblivious to the fact that every decision that gets made in political life is freighted with uncertainty of one sort or another, whether it's scientific, social, economic, uh, political, uh, what have you. We've got to get those basic understandings out there. We also have to get the understanding out there that revolutions like continental drift and, and uh, special and general relativity don't happen every day. An awful lot of people assert that the mainstream scientific position is wrong. Very few people succeed in establishing that it's wrong in any important way. And folks need to understand that the larger, the more diverse, the more consistent the body of evidence in support of a particular scientific position, the less likely it is to be overturned. People need to learn to think about probabilities and odds. Should our policymakers bet against the mainstream view of climate change, for example, because there's some chance that ultimately it will have to be revised in some significant way. That's a small chance because the body of evidence, the body of data, the diversity of measurements and observations, the consistency of those with models and so on are such that it's highly unlikely that it will be revised in a revolutionary way. Obviously, it will be revised in a lot of its details. So we have an education problem, and the difficulty is that takes a long time. We're not going to solve the problem of the confrontational uh, and paralytic aspects of our current science policy debates with education uh, overnight. And so we have to ask, what else can we do? And obviously, one of the things we can do is be clearer in government about the ground rules under which the government develops and uses scientific information for its own decisions. And that's what the openness and in government initiatives are about. That's what the scientific integrity guidelines that I very much hope to get uh, out the door uh, in, in the next month or so are, are all about. Uh, that has proved producing those to the satisfaction of everybody who has a say in it has proven to be a lot more challenging than any of us thought when uh, a year and a half ago the president rolled out that, that particular assignment. But we're going to get it done uh, because we know it's important. Uh, and, and in the meantime, the scientific principles, the principles of scientific integrity that the president laid out in his March 9, 2009 speech have, in fact, been in effect. And when we find violations of those, we stomp on them. Uh, and I think that's what, uh, that's what good government uh, uh, has to do. But th this, will, this will remain a challenge. And it's uh, a challenge in part uh, with the quality of media coverage of these debates, where unfortunately the media's interest in controversy leads to situations that if 500 scientists say A and two say B, they may get equal space uh, in the Washington Post and the New York Times, and B will get more space in the Wall Street Journal. Um, uh, yes. Okay. Good, good morning. Uh, Eleanor Powell, I'm a, a scholar at the Science and Technology Innovation Program at the Wilson Center. Uh, my question follows nicely on the previous one, actually. Um, we have seen in Europe and in the US a lack of public trust in society's ability to manage uh, the implications of new technologies. And so I think this lack of public trust is mainly linked to failures, failures to oversight and failures to anticipate. So my question is, how do you envision um, to design a capacity, a tool, an office, I don't know. Uh, how could we better anticipate the societal implications of new technologies? And how could we actually share that with Europe, with other, other countries? Do we need an office? Do we need a new way of thinking? Do we need to do crowdsourcing? Um, the key issue being anticipation. Thank you. Doesn't anybody have any easy questions? Uh, <laughs> This, this is another big one, and I, I would be in danger of giving another uh, filibuster of an answer. Um, 
it, it, it is a very tough uh, problem, the anticipation uh, of the social effects of new technologies and uh, having a set of procedures, practices, and processes in place that can gain uh, the public's trust that, that we in government uh, are protecting the public's interests when it comes to health, safety, uh, social impacts uh, of, of, uh, of technologies that may not have been uh, entirely thought through by their, by their developers. We're struggling with this in the Obama administration at the moment with an interagency task force that's actually chaired by uh, Cass Sunstein, the, the head of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs in OMB, by myself, and by uh, Ambassador E.C. Siddiqui, the deputy U.S. trade representative, and, and trying to figure out how among all the agencies uh, that have oversight and regulatory responsibilities, we can do a, a better job. We're developing a set of guidelines uh, for identifying, characterizing, and, and analyzing the consequences of technology and a set of processes for engaging the public earlier in those discussions. I think one of the things that we've learned over the years, is a, a place where open, openness and transparency uh, enters again, is if you have a closed process uh, of experts, quote, and then at the end of it you announce to the public what the answer is, it only takes a few times when those answers prove to be incorrect or oversimplified or too reassuring. It only takes a few times for the public to lose confidence. Uh, a much better way to approach it, experience has shown, is to engage policymakers and members of the public from very early on in the process in asking the questions rather than allowing the questions to be shaped only by experts and in, and in developing uh, the answers. I think that's one of the things that is key. But the other thing that I think is important is the capacity to admit mistakes. We're generally very bad at that uh, in government. Uh, the last thing anybody seems to want to do in government is admit you ever got anything wrong. And, and again, my own experience uh, is, is that if you're willing to admit from time to time that you got something wrong, people will uh, have uh, considerably more confidence in your judgments going forward. So I think participation, transparency, uh, the willingness to admit mistakes, and, and, and getting uh, a real uh, across-government interagency uh, approach to looking at these questions are all parts of the answer but I don't think I have a complete answer. Well, thank you all again. Oh, you're going to let, you're going to let one more in. One final question. <laughs> I'm from the European Commission, and I have uh, to tell you many thanks for your work. Uh, on, the, on the EU and US uh, cooperation. Uh, I have noticed that really, and I think it's historical, this uh, common view about the societal challenges that uh, science, technology, and innovation have to address. And uh, the fact that uh, now these societal challenges are the driving forces for social technology and innovation, and we are on the same line. Um, about due to the fact societal challenges are the driving force means that social dimension is important. And uh, innovation uh, to address social issues is not only technology and science, this is also the so-called social innovation. And uh, President Obama has created this Office for Social Innovation and Public uh, Participation. And my question is the following. In the list of all the things that uh, you, have, you have shown, what are the future prospects for this uh, so-called social innovation? Well, first of all, your question follows, uh, I think, very naturally on the preceding one, uh, because, again, it has to do uh, with, in various ways, the engagement of the whole society uh, in how we think about innovation and how we get it done. Uh, it's not just science, uh, math, and engineering, uh, for sure. Uh, the president knows this. I know it. Uh, I have actually uh, been increasing the number of social scientists in OSDP. We now have... Uh, an assistant director uh, for social and behavioral sciences, uh, Danny Goroff, um, whom we uh, borrowed from the Sloan Foundation. Uh, the, um, the administration has a number of uh, initiatives underway in this domain. Uh, I, I left it out uh, largely in haste. Uh, I give various versions of this talk, and it gets better but also longer every time, which is, which is problematic. I'm going to have to decide what to leave out in order to get a slide in there on, on, uh, on social innovation. But you're right. It's very important. Thank you very much. Thank you.
cover my flash drive here. <laughs> I've left more flash drives in more venues. <laughs> Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. It's, it's, it's now my pleasure to invite to the podium Dr. Arden Bement, the director of the Global Policy Research Institute at Purdue University, to introduce our second keynote speaker. Thank you, Carl. I had the great pleasure of being sandwiched between two people I greatly admire and respect, Dr. John Holdren and Dr. Cora Merritt. And over the past uh, year and a half, as acting deputy director of NSF, Cora has had many occasions to say good things about me. I'm delighted I have a chance to uh, reciprocate. She's not only a great administrator, but she's also a wonderful person. I've never known her to tell a joke. <laughs> but I've never known her not to laugh at another person's joke, no matter how awful it was. <laughs> And I've come to learn that it's her way of demonstrating that she's paying attention to you. And she has such an infectious laugh. And I know this girl very well. Uh, she has the experience to make the hard decisions, but also the wisdom to implement these decisions in the right way. I have often thought that if I was in a boat on stormy seas, I'd want her hand on the tiller. Dr. Merritt has had years of experience as a university administrator. She served six years as Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at the University of Wisconsin. And she, uh, uh, this is the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And before that, four years as Senior Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at the University of Massachusetts at Am Amherst. Her degrees include a BA degree in Sociology from Virginia Union University and an MA and PhD degree in sociology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, Cora has had long-standing relationship, relationships with the National Science Foundation, and I've been a part of that over the past 15 years. She served as the inaugural assistant director of the Directorate for Social, Behavioral, and Economic Sciences from 1992 to 1996 as assistant director of the Director for Education and Human Resources from 2007 until her appointment as Acting Deputy Director in January of 2009. She was appointed Acting Director on June 1, 2010, the day after I left. Now, Dr. Merritt is highly regarded nationally for her contributions to science administration. She holds an honorary degree from Wake Forest University and is a fellow of the two AAASs the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. It's with great pleasure that I give you Dr. Cora Merritt. Thank you so much. I, in fact, consider it a privilege to join this summit and to be introduced by Arden Bement, because he's left a lasting impression on me and on the National Science Foundation. So you cannot imagine what it means to me to have a chance to hear from someone who's been so influential for directions I've certainly taken. I'm also delighted to be here because of the emphasis of this gathering on science, technology, innovation, and sustainable growth. That direction, this emphasis, has special resonance for the National Science Foundation. Again, what I will tell you, many of you already know quite well, but I will remind all of us that the charter of NSF commits the organization to promote, promoting the progress of science to advance the national health, prosperity, and welfare. That commitment to using science to promote the welfare, that is so fundamental that it should come as no surprise that NSF was willing to serve as a sponsor for this organization, or for this summit. Now, since its founding some 60 years ago, 
NSF has been charged with ensuring that the nation's preeminence in science and engineering, that that preeminence is secure, and that the public's well-being gains from the scientific and engineering preeminence. We are fortunate to have had the advantages of that vision, that vision enhanced. I've already mentioned Dr. Bement, but also there's so many people here who've had an influence. I hate to even start citing everyone, but I would certainly have to mention Mr. Eric Block, who also contributed so much as the director of the National Science Foundation. Now increasingly, as, all of, as everyone recognizes, the well-being of not this nation alone, but of any groups of people, that well-being demands sustainable economic growth. NSF then embraces its responsibility to connect investments in science and technology to innovation, innovation first and foremost, but innovation which not only enables but sustains economic advancement. I know at this stage I should probably introduce a joke, but I don't, as Arden already says, I don't have very good jokes, so I won't bore you with those. Instead, I will tell you about the foundation acting on its responsibility to connect investments to well-being, how we seek to do that. And that's through a strong suite of research programs, a distinctive merit review process, and a policy for integrating research and education. We continue to indicate that it's this connection between research and education that must be distinctive and in which we hope everyone takes pride. This well-established review process, and this is a review process primarily of proposals from the institutions of higher education, again an indi indication of the connection between research and education. This review process has the potential to transform the intellectual landscape of science and engineering and to transform that landscape towards a very sustainable future. The support for advancing fundamental or basic knowledge, and this is the centerpiece for, of NSF, this has resulted time and again in outcomes with transformative consequences. Again, it is a pleasure to have followed Dr. Holdren because of the strong emphasis he noted for the investments in fundamental or basic or foundational work. That kind of investment has long then been the mark of the National Science Foundation. Consider just a few examples the role of NSF in the creation of the basic telecommunications networks that eventually formed the Internet, or the part of NSF in spawning the Mosaic web browser, the underpinnings of the Doppler radar, the calculations that confirmed the mechanics of the Antarctic ozone hole. It is significant that few of these innovations were envisioned when the original investments were made. No, it wasn't the case that people said, what we're going to do is create the Internet. No, it, these grew out of fundamental inquiries, curiosity, the ideas of spawning things that were not already on the agenda. We use this as to exemplify the fact that innovation from science and engineering then can arise from unanticipated activity. This means then that there is an imperative for continued investments in what, as I noted earlier, can be regarded as basic or fundamental inquiry. Those kinds of investments often are rather difficult to maintain when there are economic difficulties, but without such investments, we are unlikely to move past such difficulties. 
Now, although the mission of the National Science Foundation is always to push back the intellectual frontier, to move us beyond the boundaries we currently know, although that is the mission, the impacts of the NSF investments come as well from support for activities with immediate impacts. The American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, for example, has the two parts to it. The notion of recovery, the shorter term developments, and for reinvestment, the longer term consequences. We've said that the National Science Foundation was proud to be included in such an act, and especially because of the possibilities for the long-term investments. Nonetheless, we also make contributions to the recovery, to the shorter ter term, to the more immediate problems that arise. In fact, when Dr. Holdren talked about the three components of the President's agenda, innovation agenda, the National Science Foundation sees itself as contributing to all three of those. That the fundamental or the bu basic building blocks, as we have already cited, but also the attention to the translation of ideas, of investments into yields for the well-being of the population. An example, several examples come to mind about the kinds of things that do have those consequences for the problems that exist. These could be found, for example, in the various centers programs that, the, that NSF sponsors, the engineering research centers, the science and technology centers, the university, industry university cooperative research centers in particular, these then are places in which there is the possibility, in which there is the emphasis of bringing together the concerns, yes, at fundamental levels, but also concerns about problems that our society confronts. Outcomes from such centers then not only have generated innovations, but they've done so by generating innovations with sustainable economic consequences. At the same time, such centers have prompted questions that have their consequences for even more fundamental inquiries. In other words, there is the synergy, there is the interaction whereby investments in problems can indeed lead to identification of other questions that should be on the agenda. I said, though, that the foundation is very much concerned with the integration of research and education. This is most evident, perhaps, in the importance we place on human capital, human capital for innovation through science and engineering seems to be critical for the concerns of this summit and the concerns if we are indeed going to have the collaborations, the international collaborations on which the summit focuses. NSF strives to be known as the organization which cultivates the generation of scientists, technologists, engineers, mathematicians, or, in other words, STEM specialists. We have and take pride in a comprehensive education program, a program that arches from pre-kindergarten to postgraduate preparation, or some of my colleagues have said, if we look at it all, it's probably from womb to tomb. We don't have every part of that on our agenda, but in collaboration with others, we certainly think we can have very broad coverage. The, the mark then of the foundation is this kind of comprehensive approach that says there should be the engagement of students at every level in the fundamental, in the research that so clearly marks the world of science and engineering. We say there should be as well the building of knowledge about teaching and learning. This is as much an area for inquiry as our investigations of the universe that surrounds us. 
As we look then at what takes place, one of the questions we always ask is how do we know whatever arena we're talking about? And how do we foster experiences, critical experiences, in the formal educational setting, but also outside of the formal settings? Outside of the formal settings, there is the need, the imperative, for reaching to the wider public. Again, a topic that just emerged, or in which there was considerable attention given in the question and answer session. Why this outreach? I need not remind you. It's in part because of the importance of public engagement for the directions that science and engineering can take. We're, we do not make the decisions. We cannot act, especially when we're using public funds, with just the concerns that could be defined by a small group of specialists. No. We're very dependent on that kind of interaction. And if that's what's so central, how do we promote the very best of engagement with the public? It's also not only out of this interest that might arise from the community of experts, but we know from an array of surveys that the public is quite interested in information about science and technology that continues to come up, just curiosity. Curiosity about approaches, curiosity about the worlds that surround us, the worlds that we create. We know simultaneously, however, that the publics that we, with whom we work, those publics often are unprepared to judge the information that might be conveyed. I will not elaborate more on a point that Dr. Holdren made so forcefully and that is the information often comes through the media in which people are and people have difficulty assessing the quality of the information that we're receiving. But the public potentially can be reached through a vast informal sector. This sector consists of about 1,500 institutions in the U.S. whose mission it is to promote science learning. These institutions include science museums, zoos, botanical gardens, arboretums, natural history museums. That's just a, a handful of the arena possible for this level of engagement that we're talking about. These institutions can be, and for the National Science Foundation, we regard them as allies in the quest to make the linkages between science, engineering, and the economy. Now, although the National Science Foundation supports programs in the informal sector, one of its most significant contributions lies in its development of models for assessing outcomes and impacts of such programs. It's one thing to have novel kinds of programs and let me tell you, no one comes to us saying, I've got something that is very routine. Everybody has the most novel of ideas. But when you ask, do you have any evidence? Or what would you do to demonstrate that this is an approach that is going to yield outcomes quite different, that will make advances, that's often what is lacking very much. And that is very much characteristic of what happens in the informal sector. Thus we've said, we can take on the responsibility working collaboratively with any number of communities. Smithsonian, since I see some former Smithsonian people here, Smithsonian, uh, National Oceanic and Atmosphere Atmospheric Administration, so many other places that really do work through and work with these larger communities we've found have been extremely important partners in helping develop and to use the models that will say our responsibility will be to ensure that the investments do make the yields that are essential. Now there are strides that have been made in both the formal and informal sectors and they deserve note. But there are serious weaknesses. There are concerns as well. In fact, 
Only a few days ago, the National Academies reported that the competitive outlook for the U.S. has worsened since 2005. It was 2005 in which the academies produced the report rising above the gathering storm at the request of the U.S. Congress. That document appeared. The academies then went back, revisited what's happened since. And they said our call for strengthening pre-college education, for the doubling of the research of the federal budget for basic research. We've seen some changes, but there are still strides to be made. There are still challenges to be met. According then to the new report, while there is the latitude to fix problems, that latitude has been diminished severely by the economic recession and the national debt. The issues we also heard about earlier, as we know, these are not unique to the United States. We do have those problems, but we have at the same time the challenges associated with incorporating the talent from all segments of the population. The most recent issue of science and engineering indicators, and that is the document that tries to outline the statistics of what are the directions, what are the patterns for science and engineering in the U.S., but also in international comparisons. The most recent issue of science and engineering indicator, indicators shows that science and engineering workforce, that this workforce is not yet inclusive of or representative of the nation's general population. There is a disconnect between where the population is growing and what we're seeing in terms of science and engineering. Among them, again, Dr. Holdren mentioned the underrepresentation of women in certain parts of the science and engineering workforce. There are other segments of the population that represent, that are even more underrepresented for that workforce. As an illustration, African Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans constitute 24% of the total population of the U.S., 13% of college graduates, and only 10% of persons with college degrees in science and engineering fields. And that's also dependent on which fields, it's even lower in certain of these fields. Why do we pay attention? It's again, if we're going to draw on all talent and consider the ways in which the investments are to have returns for the economy, then we do have to ask, where are the problems? Where are the barriers? These workforce trends, the report from the academy, Several other reports all indicate these trends do not augur well for the future of science, technology, innovation, and sustainable economic growth. And I would suggest, and I don't think this is a problem for this group, that we keep these in mind and the context of this summit, that if we are talking about the future, how must we consider the human capital that's going to be needed for the linkages we have in mind? In fact, worthy of note is the, a report to be released later this week on the strategies essential for the U.S. if this nation is to cultivate the talent found in groups that are underrepresented in the science and engineering enterprise. I'm suggesting then that we take as comprehensive approach as we can when we think about the connections that have to be made among the topics, or among the areas of concern for this summit. Now, NSF, then, we regard as a preeminent supporter of research at the intellectual frontier and of the human resources needed for the conduct of that research. But, of course, NSF, and I need not again remind you of what will recur throughout this summit, NSF cannot rely entirely on the dynamics of a single nation. And again, to return to my colleague, no one st stated this, the international 
impl implications. No one stated this more boldly or acted more energetically on this theme than did Arden Bement. And I'm not at all surprised that he chose to move to, back to Purdue, but with a strong emphasis on the global environment. NSF can ill afford, he reminded us time and again, we cannot afford to overlook the pressing problems confronting the contemporary world. And we can come with any number of examples, but let me take the case of climate change as a case in point and refer again to some things that Arden had such an instrumental role in, in fact, in helping shaping, shape the budget request that is still before Congress. He said in terms of climate change, we need an educated workforce to explore the unknown terrain. There is an imperative for more accurate prediction on the effects of climate change and on ways for mitigating those effects. And of course, an imperative for reducing the dependence on fossil fuels. Now aligned with these themes, NSF then has created a portfolio of programs dubbed Science, Engineering, and Education for Sustainability, or SEAS. The idea here is to integrate new forms of energy, enhanced environmental stewardship, linking those to economic growth, and all of this being very much dependent on making sure we're developing the talent and preparing the population to ensure that we do have the sustainable future. Seas, and as you know, within the federal, within the Beltway, we always have our acronyms. So Seas responds to recommendations from any number of places, but among those, the National Science Board prepared a report building a sustainable energy future there is also the work from the fourth assessment or report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is then, it brings together the kinds of arguments from any number of places. Now I opened my comments by connecting the emphasis of this summit to priorities of the National Science Foundation. Unquestionably, the intersection of science, technology, innovation, and sustainable economic growth, that intersection holds a place of prominence on the National Science Foundation agenda. But ours is at present an unfinished agenda. It is unfinished and can benefit significantly from analyses and experiences from beyond our own boundaries. Our commitment our commitment to understanding and unraveling the complexities of the intersection is unwavering. When I say our commitment, in a way that's not quite accurate because we don't do the work itself. It is a commitment to see that the first quality work is conducted, but we are reliant on the kinds, the expertise, the interest, the talent found throughout the nation, and I'm suggesting found throughout the world. We then have this commitment, an unwavering commitment, but just as deep-seated is our interest in the kind of dialogue this forum launches. We stand prepared then to share our experiences, but we are just as prepared to learn about the constraints on and the opportunities for science and engineering to promote innovation and to learn and advance the resulting innovation, uh, how it stimulates economic growth that must be sustained. And so, on behalf of the National Science Foundation, let me again thank you for this opportunity for us to share, but just as importantly, to learn and advance the agenda. Thank you.
I'm John Palafutis. I'm with the National Inventors Hall of Fame, and I'm representing the Task Force on American Innovation. Uh, you mentioned the budget going before Congress and uh, the part of the atmosphere that you function in. Well, part of that fu function and that atmosphere is the coming elections. And yesterday, this week, uh, the Republican leadership attacked the NSF. I don't know if you saw on Republican Whip's website where they talked about a couple of uh, projects that the NSF was uh, engaging in that they say, isn't this a waste of taxpayers' money? Uh, and they encouraged the people through a website to look on the NSF website and find basically stupid projects. Now, I'm not particularly uh, uh, put at ease seeing the American public uh, sort of micromanage what you're doing, but are, are you responding to that? Because it, it has um, a, a kind of uh, saliency in the, in, the, in the current budget cuts and what a lot of us are afraid of, that the goal to double funding between 2007 and 2017 is really going to be crippled in the coming year. So is NSF dealing with that? And also, what can we do? I hope you don't mind if I fail to make this a partisan statement. I'm not going to do that. I will, however, indicate that there is, there is an interest and a concern that we have that relates to my comments about engaging with the public. Thus, in one respect, I have absolutely no problem with questions being raised about projects that, in fact, there is through the whole federal, across the federal government, you can look at titles, and often these have been the response to titles. One of those documents, incidentally, changed titles, so they weren't really the titles that were there for the projects themselves. And as you can imagine, the change, change to the topic made them seem even more bizarre. But we would welcome the inquiry because that gives much more of a chance for the interaction to determine what are those concerns. If the NSF is too separate from that larger public, I don't think it bodes well for what can happen, whether it's about budget or directions overall. So I have no problem and would invite then people following up on that website or any others to ask us about things that would be of concern to them. Thank you for the question.